Hey guys. Well, giant ships and tankers slowly sailing through the lifeless desert is definitely a sight to behold. And that's what tourists visiting the Suez Canal connecting the Red and Mediterranean Seas get to see. It significantly shortened the path for ships that used to have to sail around all of Africa just to get to the Indian Ocean. And that's just the geographical portion. The Suez Canal actually connects entire parts of the world, Europe and Asia, and the tariffs on transported loads through the canal bring Egypt huge profits at over $5 billion a year. The canal optimizes movement of ships between EU country ports on one side and Chinese, Japanese, and Middle Eastern ports on the other side. And there's no current alternative. But it recently drew attention from all over the world, and that's no exaggeration. So on the morning of March 23, 2021, at 7.40 a.m. local time, the gigantic 1,312-foot-long container ship the Ever Given, one of the largest container ships in the world, was moving along the Suez Canal. It turned sideways in the canal and ran aground with its stern and aft ends on the banks. We'll look at how this affected the world economy and Egypt's in particular later. But for now, let's look at the history of the canal itself. So not everyone knows that the so-called Canal of the Pharaohs, connecting the Nile to the Red Sea, was dug in the second millennium BCE and ran from west to east. Later, construction and restoration of that canal was done by the powerful Egyptian pharaohs Ramses II and Necho II. Herodotus writes that Necho II, who ruled Egypt from 610 to 595 BCE, started building the canal from the Nile to the Red Sea, but wasn't able to finish it. The canal was finished in about 500 BCE by Emperor Darius I, the Persian conqueror of Egypt. As a monument to the event, Darius built granite pylons on the coast of the Nile, including one near Karbat, 130 miles from Suez. In the 3rd century BCE, the canal was made shipworthy by Ptolemy II Philadelphus. It started a bit further along the Nile than the previous canal in the Fakusa region. Diodorus Cielus describes the object created by Ptolemy II's engineers as a witty sluice gate that solved the problem of falling from heights and potential mixing of the Nile's water and silt. The channel was fairly wide and could fit three triremes across. Later, Roman Emperor Trajan, who ruled the Roman Empire from 98 to 117 CE, deepened and broadened the canal. The canal was known as Trajan's River and it facilitated ship travel, but was abandoned once again. Now, over 1,000 years went by before someone tried to dig another canal. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte was in Egypt and saw the potential of building a canal connecting the Mediterranean and Red Seas. He signed off on preliminary measurements led by engineer Lapierre. The team came to a mistaken conclusion that the water level of the Red Sea was 30 feet above the water level of the Mediterranean, which would therefore require a canal with locks. According to Lapierre's designs, the canal should have run from the Red Sea to the Nile partially along the old route, then cross the Nile near Cairo, and end at the Mediterranean near Alexandria. Lapierre didn't think they could make it significantly deep, and his canal was unsuitable for large vessels. Lapierre said he spent 30 to 40 million francs on the project. The project failed not because of technical or financial problems, but political ones. Napoleon lost hope in conquering Egypt. After hearing Lapierre's report on December 6, 1800, Napoleon said, It's a monumental task, but I cannot undertake it currently. Maybe the Ottoman government will tackle it sometime and bring glory to their name and simplify the existence of their empire. In 1841, the errors in Lapierre's calculations about the differences in the two seas water levels were proved. Those calculations had already been disputed by Laplace and mathematician Fourier based on theoretical images and discussions about a canal resumed. In 1855, Ferdinand de Lesepes received a concession from Said Pasha, the Khedive of Egypt, whom de Lesepes had met as a French diplomat in the 1830s. Said Pasha approved the creation of a company aimed at building a sea canal open to ships from all countries. 
The project was given to Lenent de Villafonce. Again, in 1855, de Lesseps attained approval for the project from the Ottoman Sultan, but was only able to found the company in Paris in 1859. Canal construction began in that same year and was undertaken by de Lesseps' Suez Canal Company. The Egyptian government was given 44% of the shares, France got 53%, and the remaining 3% was given to other countries. Now, technical difficulties in building the canal were enormous. They had to work under the sweltering sun, in the sandy desert, without any fresh water. The work conditions were extreme, and there wasn't enough water or medicine. The work was done by local fellow peasants and convicts who died by the thousands. In the beginning, the company was to use up to 1,600 camels just to deliver water to the workers, but by 1863, the company completed a small freshwater canal from the Nile that ran along the same route as the ancient canals. It wasn't designed for ships, but just to deliver fresh water, first to the workers, then to the settlements that would spring up along the canal. It made the work easier but the death rate among the workers was still high. The workers were provided by the Egyptian government, but European workers were also required. In total, 20 to 40,000 people worked on the canal. The first part to be finished was the north part through a swamp and Lake Manzala, and then through the level section to Lake Timsa. Then there were two great drop-offs. The first, at the long-since dried-up Great Bitter Lake, whose bottom was 30 feet below sea level. After filling in the lakes, the builders went to the end southern portion. The total length of the canal was about 108 miles, including the length of the canal through the Isthmus of Suez, which was about 100 miles long, the sea channel along the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea at 5.7 miles long, and the Gulf of Suez at about 1.9 miles long. The canal's width at water level is 390 to 490 feet wide and 147 to 197 feet wide at the bottom. The depth of the freshwater channel was 40 to 43 feet deep, but then increased to up to 66 feet deep. Now, the canal officially opened for ships on November 17, 1869. The Suez Canal opening was attended by Empress of France Eugenia, Emperor of Austria-Hungary, Franz Joseph I, with the President Minister of Hungary, Andrashi the Dutch prince and princess, and the Prussian prince. Egypt had never seen such a ceremony and never had so many high-ranking European guests before. The celebration lasted seven days and nights and cost Khedib Ismail 28 million gold francs. In 1956, the Egyptian government decided to nationalize the canal belonging to British and French shareholders. That caused an armed conflict where the canal was significantly damaged by the Anglo-Franco-Israeli combatants, resulting in the canal being closed until October 1957. Since then, the canal has never stopped functioning for a significant period of time. So now back to the container ship, the Ever Given. It was sailing under the Panama flag, and it was going to the Netherlands from China. Now, due to bad weather and a sandstorm, which complicated navigation, the ship ran aground in the narrowest part of the Suez Canal, spinning due to the wind and blocking the water artery completely. The ship was 1,300 feet long and had about 224,000 tons of cargo on board. The stern and aft were caught on opposite sides of the canal. The accident resulted in canal traffic stopping. According to information from March 26th, over 150 other ships were waiting in line to pass through the canal. And by March 29th, the line had grown to over 450 ships. Now, similar incidents in the Suez Canal have happened. It's rarely, but they've happened. Uh, like in September 1990, the American container ship Robert Lee ran into the Eastern Canal Bank, leading to over 80 ships congesting. Movement was restored the next day. On November 7th, 2004, the tanker Tropic Brilliance ran aground near Ismailia blocking traffic. Over 100 ships were waiting near the northern and southern entrances then. The ship was dislodged after two days. 
and there have been other incidents that lead to blockages lasting a few hours, but one so grand had never happened before. Measures taken to dislodge the container ship were diverse and many since the canal blockage was costing Egypt about $14 million per day. But that's a modest sum compared to the losses to world trade at $400 million per hour, or $9.6 billion per day. So the first attempts to remove the ship with tugboats were unsuccessful, so two excavators were brought to make the bottom deeper. 15 to 20,000, 530 to 700,000 cubic feet of sand needed to be removed from under the ship's stern to free up 40 to 53 feet around the ship. By March 28th, 9,000 tons of water weight was removed. And 14 tugboats were brought to free the ship. Additionally, four excavators worked to deepen the canal coast near the container ship's stern. Besides that, nine tugboats tried to pull the ship off the ground and were able to move the stern together. The ship was successfully removed on March 29th at 3 p.m. local time and towed out after 953,000 cubic feet of sand were removed from the stern part of the ship. Egypt's president, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, announced the successful unblocking of the canal. One-tenth of the planet's trade goes through the Suez Canal. Famous clothing and appliance brands had announced the colossal damage they experienced because of the blockage. Likewise, there are large problems with Tesla deliveries and Finland is running out of coffee. As far as short-lived products go, according to the deliverers, they were simply thrown overboard. The blockage of Arabian oil tankers through the Suez Canal in the first days after the incident led to a rise in oil prices by over 5%, and the price for delivering oil products overseas almost doubled. The incident made world shippers look over their schedules, change shipping routes, and resend containers back to their clients. The ship blocked the canal for a week, and it's hard to imagine the blow to the world economy if the problem was solved in such a timely manner. Well, that's all for today. Be sure to leave us a like if you learned something new. And uh, let us know what you thought in the comments. And we'll see you again next time.